Good morning, everybody. I don't know if the video is all good. Uh, stop me if not. Good morning, everybody. This is my uh, first Dev Conf. My name is Cosimo Shecki, and I'm going to be talking to you about something that we did uh, with Debian at the company that I work at, uh, Endless. We built a uh, Debian derivative, a uh, different Debian distribution that uses some technologies that um, are typically not exactly what you think uh, when you think of Debian, namely OS3 and Flatpak. So, oops, where am I? All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or other places with the Cosimo C handle. Um, I am a long uh, time GNOME contributor and GNOME aficionado. Um, so I've been maintaining a lot of modules in GNOME, uh, the Nautilus file manager, a whole bunch of other things. Now I don't do that as much anymore, uh, but I serve on the GNOME board of directors. Uh, and for any GNOME related inquiries, you can find me at cosmosiagnome.org. And my day job is managing the engineering team at Analyst that built uh, this operating system. So, basically three things uh, that I would like you to get at the end of this talk. Uh, first of all, what Endless OS is, if you don't know what it is. Uh, so hopefully you'll know that at the end of it. Um, how to deploy, well, first of all, what is OS3 and how to deploy Debian, Debian file system tree using OS3. Um, and then finally, I have a super modest straw man for how Debian can um, adopt OS3 a little bit more and uh, why that would be useful to a bunch of people. So, but before everything, a little bit about Endless and a little bit about Endless OS. I want to talk just for a few moments about uh, the company. This is, you know, not a talk about Endless at all. Uh, but Endless was founded four, five, five years ago now to bring technology to people that don't have it. So, to kind of the next billion computer users. So, we target really people like this, you know, uh, maybe. In people in Indonesia, people that are first-time computer buyer, um, and you know this is uh, a slide that my uh, my our CEO always uses. This is um, you know an ad. It looks a bit Photoshop, but it's an ad that we actually find in San Francisco. So you know it's an ad by Mozilla. The internet should be accessible to all. What are the you know in twenty. 17, what are the four really fundamental needs of human beings, food, water, shelter, and the internet. And you know, Mozilla, our friends at Mozilla keep it fair and open, so we we'll love them for that. Uh, but the reality is that the internet is just not a thing for most people in the world, actually for about half of the world population. Uh, and you know, Mobile internet and mobile penetration has helped a lot uh, with getting some data uh, to places that previously didn't have it. However, there is a big disparity between what uh, somebody can afford uh, in terms of an internet plan on their phone. 300 megabytes, I think it's the average uh, data plan size in emerging countries. And 60 gigabytes, which, you know, 300 megabytes versus 60 gigabytes, it doesn't even show on a graph, right? Uh, is actually how much data a typical desktop, laptop, uh, computer consumes. So Endless, uh, you know, the product that we build uh, wants to solve this problem, um, solving the availability of internet. And effectively, this is a very, very simplified, you know, uh, diagram of what we do, but we preload a lot of content on the device itself when you buy it. So when you buy you know, a Windows computer or a you know, Chromebook or whatever other computer, most of the things that you have on the computer will need internet. So it's pretty much useless. Actually, I went to a, a shop uh, a few, few weeks ago and tried a brand new Windows 10 uh, Dell laptop. The only application that I was able to run was camera. I think even Solitaire in Windows 10 requires an internet connection, which is insane. Uh, so what we do is we preload a lot of content on the uh, device itself 
we refresh this content whenever internet is available or really whenever anything that can refresh that content is available. So we can refresh content using a USB key or using you know, um, other computers in your local network if they have content that we are interested in. And then all well, this content is accessed through native applications uh, that we ship on the device itself. So uh, yeah, it's, this is another way of looking at it. Everything is searchable. It is very, very intuitive, like for people that uh, have not typically used a computer before, but maybe are used to a tablet or a smartphone. This will look very familiar. Apps are front and center. Uh, and you know the way that you install or remove applications is through uh, an application store that kind of takes care of everything. Um, so you know we are really aiming not at obviously uh, you guys you know this this population of very uh, experts, uh, distro builders, and you know operating system engineers. Um, but uh, we have tested this user interface and we built it over you know a few years of research on the field, and we found that it behaves very well for people that are used to uh, a handheld device, uh, which is, you know, primarily, it, it's not Windows anymore, uh, the, you know, the uh, contender for, uh, for our software, it's actually uh, Android. Uh, and what we started doing uh, at Endless very recently is we started shipping with these uh, two big names in many uh, regions of the world. So you can buy right now uh, in Indonesia or in Thailand or in Vietnam um, uh, an Endless, uh, well, an Asus laptop or an Acer laptop that has Endless preloaded. So you know, this is kind of to give you the context of the users that we try to address and why we have made certain decisions when architecting the operating system. So, as I mentioned, uh, this is an operating system based on GNOME. Um, so, the first definition you can have for Endless. Uh, it is a, uses a fairly stock GNOME 3.22 base. Uh, it has a custom shell and other pieces of, um, of interface on top, such as, uh, for instance, a very simplified initial setup for people that, um, you know, don't want to spend too much time configuring their computer when they first get it. it kind of works out of the box. Uh, as I said before, GNOME software, so an application center kind of experience, is the, the, the main way that you get other software that's not on the device or the main way that you manage uh, the software on the device. And, you know, the technology stack is just not very interesting because it's the same thing that a modern uh, Debian or any other distribution really uses. So SystemD, all the various U's, uh, your power your disks, BlueZ, Pulsaudio, Alahi, that kind of stuff. Um, Endless is also a Linux distribution based on Debian. Um, so our uh, base OS is Debian Jesse uh, for the version that we have released right now. Uh, we are in the process of updating to Stretch um, right now in, uh, for our next release. And um, of course, we don't take everything stock from Debian. We have our custom set of packages that we overlay on top of Debian itself. And those are managed with an OBS instance. So we use the, uh, I think it's Open Build Server. It's a, it's an open SUSE project uh, that also works very well with, with that packages. Uh, the kernel right now is based on Ubuntu. Uh, this was a decision that we made uh, a while ago, and it's kind of hard to change once you have it, but Ubuntu also has uh, a lot more support for more, you know, uh, other kind of hardware. Uh, so we don't mind that. And we are available right now for x86-64 and also for ARM v7. Um, because one of the first, I, I didn't mention it, but we used to make uh, hardware devices, and one of them, uh, we still do, is uh, based on AMLogic S805. So we have a whole uh, version of the distribution that just um, is, is you know, built for ARMv7. And uh, right now we have a predictable release cycle. This is you know, kind of a difference uh, with, with Debian, so we uh, follow a little more or less what um, you know, other distributions do, we try to align with upstreams such as GNOME. So we have a major version every six months that, you know, rebases the whole stack on top of the new version of GNOME. And every month we make a minor release that is just bug fixes or, you know, other minor features. Um, 
And you know, we I, I can go into that in more detail if you're interested later, but uh, it's really hard to get it to less than a month. Uh, uh, sorry, to more than a month. So uh, many times we, you know, our hand is forced to uh, make releases very often because of hardware support. Um, on the other hand, so this feels pretty standard so far, but it's not a traditional distribution uh, because the uh, I think the main difference with what I consider a traditional distribution is that packages are not exposed to the end user at all. There is no package manager available. If you try to use app, app to get, it will say no, you cannot do that. If you try to use the package, you can you know uh, search for things because we ship the package database, but you cannot install anything. You're like. But that's it's kind of it's kind of weird. Um, so the OS is really a single deliverable. It is a set of bits, kind of how it is on Android or iOS, and you take it as it is. It goes forward forever, uh, and you cannot change it. So you do not, as a user, have fine control over what's installed in the operating system. You can install applications. You can remove applications. You can install maybe. Other small things like printer drivers or codecs, um, but you do not control the operating system itself as a user. Big difference. Uh, and you know, as a corollary of that, OS and applications are separate. So the operating system, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go through that um, a little bit later. Uh, but the applications are managed through Flatpak, um, and the operating system is managed with OS3. Uh, these two things have. Uh, really no relation to each other in a way. Uh, they're just different layers, uh, effectively. So the OS can update independently of the applications, independently of the runtimes that the applications use. And almost every bit is delivered like that. So there are a few exceptions, as I mentioned, printer drivers, uh, but uh, pretty much. So, so how do we do that? Um, how, do, how do we do it? Um, and mostly, why did we choose? <laughs> First of all, why did we choose to do that? That's a pretty, you know, different decision than what most uh, desktop distributions do. And the first reason is that um, packages are hard to test. Uh, all the configurations that a given system can be, especially given the number of packages that are available in distributions like Debian. Uh, makes it effectively impossible to test all of them, uh, especially with a small QA team. So, you know, the first reason is kind of uh, easy to test, or we kind of, you know, decided to favor uh, the, the quality of the bits that we're shipping over the number of bits. Um, the second reason is that we really want to deliver the, the same bits to every user. So, we do not want to you know, think, oh, do you have uh, this version of this package, this other version of this package? Did something happen before? Did you upgrade from you know an uh, old version and the migration script didn't work? Um, this, you know, if, if, you, if, if your requirement is you actually have to deliver always the same bits to everybody, these are not problems. You can you know uh, first compose your system on our end and then deliver it to everybody in the same way. You're, you're, you're ensured that everybody gets exactly the same thing that you have tested. Um, also, upgrades can break easily. I mean, I can, I'm can. i sure that at least uh, some of you here uh, have had my same experience where you, know, you install a new version of a package, it just doesn't work, it breaks, you have to resort to the terminal, you have to do some magic, you have to you know, remove, go back, that happens. I mean, it's it's fine if you are a uh, somebody like me or somebody like you know probably most of you in the audience. Uh, but it's really not good if you are uh, the person that I showed at the beginning uh, in Indonesia. Uh, power loss is also a real issue, um, right? Sometimes we deploy computers in situations that don't have great power supply, and you know maybe power is intermittent. We really wanted a system where we can deliver bits, we can deliver updates that is very resilient, very resistant to things just exploding at any time. Uh, and 
packages are really not atomic in a way. So you know, you have you, you install it, maybe the power goes out during your the middle of your like post install script or something, and you know, who knows what state it is at that point. Uh, it's also very easy to uh, show yourself. In, 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 in the feed, like if you remove the wrong thing, if you type the wrong command, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you need to know what you're doing. Uh, and mostly it's just an unfamiliar concept for new users. Uh, so, you know, uh, there are many cases, what many cases that one can make, why packages are a great idea. Uh, for these reasons, we chose uh, not to use them for, for this particular deployment. Uh, what we chose instead is OS3. So I took this kind of uh, from the website. So it's a, it, effectively it's a Git-like model for binaries. Like that, I think that's uh, that's the, the easiest way to describe it. So you take uh, a whole file system tree, big binary blobs. Uh, you commit it to a repository. A repository can have many branches, can have many you know remotes and things like that. And then you download uh, those bits again on the client side. And this uh, happens atomically. So, um, you know, not a chance that it's part of Project Atomic, which is a, a, a Red Hat, um, Fedora based uh, way of using this. Um, that's kind of where it originated. Um, atomic means that you are guaranteed by the system that you are either. At any given time, you are either fully in the old version of the system or fully in the new version of the system. There are no in-betweens. So you can go forward, you can roll back. Uh, at any point, you are completely in the old one or completely in the new one, uh, which you know, fits exactly the kind of requirements that we wanted. Uh, the data itself, is uh, it also has you know, a way of um, it can, can be distributed pretty simply, so um, all you need is an HTTPS server. Um, it has kind of a Git-like object repository behind the scenes, so if you look at it, you know, the files are not stored by their file system, but they are kind of content hashed and then content addressed in this repository, and that's what you serve uh, to your clients. Um, and each kind of commit that you make to this binary tree uh, it can be GPG signed, uh, which can also, of course, be verified once you download it. So you are sure that you get the same bits, um, you know, as the vendor intended. Uh, something that can, kind of comes from what uh, I mentioned before about the object model repository uh, is that the data is deduplicated. So each file. Uh, you know, traditionally, if the same file occurs in two packages, maybe in different directories, um, that really uh, occupies twice the space on this. Uh, here, it's deduplicated, so uh, being content addressed means that there's only one copy of it, and then there are hard links uh, from that copy to uh, the various actual locations on the file in the file system tree once it's deployed. Uh, that also means that you can very cheaply store different versions of the same tree, right? Because uh, you know you change a package, maybe you change a program in there, it won't change the whole file system. Uh, you can make effectively two versions of it that whose only difference is this new file or this new set of files. All the other files will not be. Uh, stored twice on this, even though you can choose to boot in one or the other deployments. So it's very powerful. Uh, and another way of delivering updates is doing deltas between commit. This is supported uh, as a native operation in OS3. So instead of delivering the files individually, you can deliver a blob in a single request, which is a lot more efficient, that's also compressed, um, and it's just the binary differences between the old commit and the new commit that you're going to deploy. Uh, so that's really good. Uh, it supports integration with bootloaders such as Grub and U-Boot, which is perfect for us because we support ARM and x64. Um, and finally, it's built in a way that makes it easy to integrate with the operating system. So, you know, I, I really like this project. Uh, you guys should check it out. <laughs> uh,
Um, Flatback, I won't uh, talk a lot about Flatback because Simon has a talk about Flatback uh, right after this. Um, you should go to his talk. But I just want to mention it here because it's what we um, use to deploy our applications. So um, you can build, uh, basically Flatback is a building and distribution system for apps on Linux, similar to Snappy, similar to AppImage. It's that kind of, you know, when, uh, mindset. Um, each application is a bundle that's independent from all the other bundles. You can install them, remove them kind of independently. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, it, it supports a very secure model um, of uh, application confinement through the use of technologies such as namespaces and cgroups in the kernel that really, you know, uh, give the developer of the app very fine grain control over what the application can or cannot do. Um, so, I was making you know a case before, so uh, a case before as to why not use uh, packages for our distro. But everybody uses packages when they're building a distro, and for good reasons because they're a very established concept. Um, there are very high quality teams that maintain these packages typically, including most of you here, uh, and thank you for that. There are lots of tooling around how to build a package, how to deploy a package, how to install and install. There's tons of documentation. It's really the perfect system to build a distro, uh, in my mind. Um, you know, there's others that have tried doing, you know, uh, Yocto style stuff, JSON stuff, but I mean, this is this works very, very well if we refer to who is building the distro. So we really, you know, our goal when thinking about this tool was really to bridge these two these two worlds. We would like to uh, deploy packages Debian style to a file system tree, and then use that as an input to create an OS tree to deliver that to our users. Um, it has to be an automatable operation, so we don't want to be typing commands every time that we want to do it. It has to be uh, a reproducible, uh, you know, this is kind of, kind of a, a loaded term, but uh, if you run it twice, it has to, you know, uh, work every time effectively and ideally not add any complications uh, by the process itself. I know that not all the packages are sort of perfectly reproducible, so if you unpack a package twice, maybe you'll get slightly different output because of timestamps or whatnot, uh, but within those bounds, it should be reproducible. It should work with existing packages, like you're saying, um, and it should support customizations outside of the package system itself, um, and you'll see why. Um, and this is the project that we built to, uh, to, to do that. So a little bit of history to this, uh, this is, we use it mostly as an internal tool. Uh, this is a uh, public version of the tool that I uh, that a colleague of mine made last year. Uh, I updated it for this conference, so you, you know, uh, please try it, please download it, check it out. However, it is uh, kind of untested in this specific configuration because we have our own hooks and our own, you know, internal add-ons to that, so I haven't uh, tried it fully, but uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good start. Um, so, uh, Devo S3 Builder, uh, what does it do? It's designed in uh, stages, uh, and it's mostly like really four stages uh, that you need, you need to do to uh, deploy the system. The first one is a check for updates. So, should a new OS3 be built given the set of packages that I am giving you right now? Um, if so, let's assume that the answer is yes, uh, the first time it will be yes for sure, there's the OS stage, which creates using dbootstrap um, and then basically taking a meta package, which is a list of dependencies, just simply a list of dependencies uh, that should go in the file system, it deploys everything. So it makes a dbootstrap into a temporary directory that installs all these other packages into a temporary directory as well. Uh, that effectively will have the fully deployed file system tree as if it was, you know, a regular distro. Takes that, 
creates a commit to a local OS3 repository during the OS3 stage and then signs it with the GPG key that you give it. And then finally, it publishes that OS3 to another server or to a set of different servers. In reality, the uh, published stage, like in, at least in the copy that uh, is there, is um, basically empty, like up to you, where do you want to publish it? If you don't want to publish it anywhere, you have the local copy, and that's fine. Uh, and you know, of course, you have an error stage if something goes wrong. Maybe you want to put, you know, a notification to your uh, Jenkins, to your GitHub, to your, you know, whatever CI thing you have to notify that something went wrong. Um, so each stage here can be customized. Uh, there is a core logic to the stage. So you know how you deploy the deboost, how do you do the deboost trap, how you deploy the meta package. Uh, those are core logic, and then there's a number of hooks that you can, uh, you you know, uh, distribution builder can add uh, to each stage. So things like I want to publish to this other server, I want you know to add these new files that are custom, or I want to, I don't know, uh, yeah, like maybe change a configuration in a specific uh, environment, or things like that. Um, the configuration of how all these things are put together is separate uh, in the code base, and you can, uh, you know, it has usable defaults, but you can customize it per product, which is, um, effectively uh, the kind of the top level configuration of where you're building. Like I could build a Debian stretch OS3 product and a Debian SID OS3. Uh, and those would, would be likely two different products because they have different packages. A branch, um, which is, you know, different versions of the same per architecture, per platform. Platform is kind of a weird concept, but I won't go into it. Uh, and each of these things can be customized. So it's very, very flexible, uh, but kind of useful um, from the get-go. Um, just as, a, as an aside, uh, making these trees has a cost. So especially maintaining them has a cost. So, you know, one could be inclined looking at this saying, oh, I'm going to make, you know, a uh, hundred different versions of OS3. Well, uh, making an OS3 is not exactly like maintaining a distro, uh, but it's similar because you 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 know uh, you will end up being you end up facing the same problems that you're trying to solve, as in too many configurations to test, combinatorial explosions, and stuff like that. Uh, so we have limited, you know, kind of intentionally uh, trying to limit ourselves to just making OS3s when needed. So per architecture per product, per platform. Uh, and next hardware is um, an OS3 that we make especially for people that have bleeding edge hardware, so it just has like a different kernel or something like that. Um, and people can opt into it if it doesn't work, if Atlas doesn't work uh, with the regular one. So again, very simple. Uh, the Jenkins CI runner uh, calls this dev OS3 builder, invokes this on a timer, for instance, every night, if you want to build uh, a, you know, a snapshot of uh, your uh, distribution every night, it pulls the packages from OBS, builds it, uh, commits it to the OS3 server. This can you know, be run manually on a timer, however you want it. What happens after that? Um, the, uh, in, in, our, in our deployment, you, know, this, this, you, you can do it pretty much however you want it. Uh, in our deployment, we have a three-stage um, uh, server policy, basically. When you build an OS3, it's first published to a staging server that is internal. So we use that to do our QA. We uh, push from the staging to uh, a tree that we call demo, um, which is public beta, kind of, um, whenever, bi-weekly, or roughly bi-weekly. Um, and then at really at release time, when you know the beta passes the public QA, the staging passes internal QA, uh, we push everything to production, and this happens again once a month uh, for minor and once every six months for uh, major releases. 
updates are installed automatically on client machines. So we feel so confident that this won't break that we just install it on users' machines, uh, provided that they are not connected with expensive connections or uh, mobile kind of internet, because you know that would upset people because it costs their data. Uh, but if you're connected to Wi-Fi or to Ethernet, we just download it and install it, and then we ask you to reboot whenever you like to uh, get into the new version of the OS. And of course, you can manually install it. So this is how it works on the client. You have this component, EOS Updater, who is responsible to kind of like pull and uh, you know, fetch the latest data uh, from the OS3 server. And then, again, you're either in the new deployment if everything goes well, or you're staying the old. Uh, there's never an in-between broken situation. And you know, it actually never happened so far, touching wood, that, uh, uh, that this didn't work. So it, it's very reliable. Uh, however, sometimes you really need packages. And this is you know, one, of the, one of the things that I will discuss at the end. Um, to develop the distribution, we, we the, you know, endless developers, we still use packages internally. So we have kind of you know, a few hacks that uh, we built to make this possible. One is EOS convert system, which basically takes everything that I've told you about OS3, trashes it completely, and restores the whole normal package system so you can use apt. Uh, there's OS3 Admin Unlock, which is a really interesting thing. Uh, it makes your uh, user temporarily read-write um, and overlays some file system on top of it so that you can actually install things temporarily until you reboot. Uh, and I think you can even pass it a flag to keep it after the reboot. But anyway, it's still a bit like, uh, what am I doing here, overlay FS, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Uh, and right now, this is strictly for internal use, so we don't advertise this. I mean, if, of course, like we ship this command, so if you find it on an endless system, you know, uh, good job, but <laughs> we, don't, we don't tell you to use it. Uh, so like, this doesn't really feel like the right solution to me. Um, uh, yeah, I said I'm not going to talk about Flatpak, but the one thing I want to mention is that we tried to build Flatpaks using a very similar kind of uh, dev-based builder. It didn't go very well. Uh, it's, it's complicated. Um, yeah, if you're interested later and we have time in the Q&A, I'll talk about it. So, uh, how can we improve this? Um, I think, you know, before before I go to that, I have, you know, I, I have a simple idea, but um, some of the lessons that we have learned from doing this, right? One is that software can only really be tested as a whole. Like many times, we have, you know, uh, tried to change the way we test things to just test the individual change, the individual package, things like that. It never really worked. Like there are many cases where the integration is really the difficult part. Uh, and testing as a whole has a ton of value. Um, terminals are a nightmare for users. So anything that requires uh, going to the terminal, basically for the kind of users that we're trying to target, we lost them already. And smartphone OS uh, is the gold standard. It's what people compare the software that uh, you put in, in, in front of them to. Because um, you know we grew up with uh, uh, desktops or laptops or whatnot, um, many people uh, in other areas of the world, they just grow up with uh, phones and tablets. And that's, that's the digital experience that they have, and that's what they'll compare it to. Um, another lesson, decoupling deliverables has a ton of value for us as well. Like The moment that we were able to say, you know, all the applications don't need to follow the OS, we don't need to keep them up to date and working with the libraries that are provided by the operating system, they can move at their own pace, they can be released whenever, uh, and you know, and the OS can evolve this other way. Once you have figured out the interfaces that you need to do that, that is absolutely super valuable. And I don't know, I think it would be valuable for, uh, you know, for, for other distributions as well. Um, predictable quick release cycles, especially if you work with hardware manufacturers, 
are uh, very, very important. So, you know, for us, the ability to, you know, make releases of the operating system, especially, uh, very quickly has, um, has a lot of value. And working with hardware is hard. Uh, you know, not a, it's, it's not just a pun, it's true. Uh, there are many requirements that come from working with hardware vendors. Uh, and yeah, there's always something else that you haven't thought of. So it's, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite a challenge. So in any event, take all of this, uh, what I'm about to say, with a grain of salt. I don't know really how Debian works. As I mentioned, this is my first step comp, but I'm not a Debian developer. So, you know, uh, I don't know how things work. But for me, the um, main issue with the setup, uh, at least for how I see it, with the setup that I've described, if I seriously wanted to propose it to a Debian audience, is that you cannot install packages. Like, you, you know, all, all, all of us, uh, all of you will want to install packages there. This is actually a problem that's solved on Fedora. Uh, so Fedora, now they're working on a system called Fedora Atomic, uh, which tries to bring some of this technology into the main line of the distribution. And they've developed this technology called RPM OS3 that allows you to layer packages on top of the distro itself. So you have some tooling to rebase the package on top of the tree whenever you update the tree, um, or upgrade the package together with the tree. Uh, that's all, you know, fairly transparent and mostly it doesn't lose some of the guarantees and nice things that OS3 gives you. For instance, that updates are still guaranteed to be atomic. Um, so I, I don't know, it feels like I'm, I'm not an, an expert in uh, the package or that format, but this feels like it should be something achievable, uh, especially if, you know, if it was done with RPM um, on, on Fedora. Uh, and I think that with this, you know, if you had, it, it, me personally, if I had something like, um, like this, where, you know, where the system is managed by OS3, I have something like that OS3 to allow installing new packages on top when I need it. Uh, I would want my desktop system to be managed like that. You know, now I'm, I'm, running, uh, I'm running Fedora on this because I needed virtual machines and we don't have a virtual machine app on Endless. But when I used to run Endless on it, it was amazing because I didn't need to care about anything. Like, you know, the OS always gets updated, it's tested. Uh, Many people use exactly the same thing I'm using, so if I have a problem, for sure others will. If I don't, other people won't. Like, you know, it's, it's very nice. Uh, it's hard to go back to uh, managing your own packages after that. So, I would love if Debian could create an OS3 version of the base desktop system. Uh, basically, you know, uh, very similar meta package definition to the one that we have. At the end of the day, Endless is a desktop as well. Um, and, you know, Debian could build a reference OS3 uh, for uh, a base desktop system, like, just like that. There could even be different meta packages for different desktops, if that's what people want. Uh, and I don't know if Debian has a concept of package groups. This is something that uh, they have on Fedora, where, you know, these are, there are already these kind of meta packages that you install, and it grabs all the dependencies, like, you know, you do install KD, and it just has everything. You don't need to know all the dependencies manually. Um, also, if uh, I, I know that Debian, inside Debian there is a project for uh, okay, <laughs> uh, there is a project for reproducible builds, um, and with that you could really help share the bottom layers, right? Because whenever you know you. Uh, yeah, basically all these different desktop configurations could sh use the data application technology of OS3 and share the same data, and users could even very easily switch between different uh, trees without the complication of, oh, how does the KDE package interact with the GNOME package whenever I have both of them installed, which always opens like huge discussions and I'm, you know, I've seen it from both the perspective of an upstream developer and a distro developer. Um, and, you know, if, if Debian did this, uh, then there's a good chance that how to build and deploy these Debian trees pushed to, to, to an OS tree 
would become a standard and not something that you know uh, we have uh, made up at Atlas. Uh, and for us, or somebody else building on top of that, yeah, uh, there would be many advantages. For instance, you know, uh, I mean, we, we wouldn't need to do most of the things that we do, but we would just host our binary builds and adding our packages on top of you know a base that is shared with the rest of Debian. So we would do, actually do most of the package development uh, work uh, directly in Debian. So, a um, few conclusions. Um, I think, you know, the, the world of OS trees uh, is very inflexible, the world of distributions uh, is very flexible, but I think that we can, uh, we can find a good middle ground um, where we get the best of both worlds, so I think that we can uh, learn um, something from each other and teach something to each other. Uh, uh, right now, integrators uh, and their users would be those who would benefit the most uh, from you know, a tree-based approach writing Debian. Uh, but I think that with something else on top, like DevOS tree, uh, uh, this has a lot of potential to cater to Debian users as well. Um, and you know, distributing OS3 binaries can be achieved quite easily. Like the, uh, on the server side, you know, the infrastructure required for that is not really a big deal and I'm sure that you know, Debian has uh, a lot more complicated things <laughs> that, that, uh, that occupy the infrastructure. Um, and you know, if there is interest uh, for a project like this in the community, uh, we are uh, here, to, you know, we as in, as in Endless, we are here to help, like we would like to get involved in a project like that if there is an interest. Uh, so, so that's it. Questions? Hi there. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I find it uh, pretty interesting. Uh, I like your overall approach. One thing that I'd like to see or, or to hear from you is um, I've, I've read a lot of, of what seems to me like uh, overheated advocacy in favor of Snappy, Flatpak, things like this. Um, it sounds to me like you've identified pretty much three different types uh, or three different approaches to system integration. The package model, the OS tree model, and let's call it the Flatpak model. Um, and I think your presentation goes a long way towards um, shedding light on this issue because it's not like, well, one of these systems is just going to kill the other two off. Um, so could you distinguish in particular, I know you wanted to uh, leave some space for Simon's talk on Flatpak, but uh, you very nicely contrasted where OS tree is useful versus where packages are useful. Could you shed some light on where you think the Flatpak uh, app distribution model um, has advantages and disadvantages relative to the package uh, orientation because that seems to me like the the real point of friction right now in the wider community. Yeah, um, and you know this is my um, I know I'm wearing a flat back t-shirt, but this is my first song. Uh, <laughs> I think um, flat back. Basically, right now, if you want to develop an application, you want to distribute it to as many users as you can. There's really no way around it, uh, no way around you going to every distribution and convincing them that they have to distribute your application. So either they will do it because they like the application or you have to kind of advocate for your app to go there. That's actually not how it works on pretty much any other platform that I know. Like usually people, you know, there are, um, you know, applications just exist somewhere and they either exist in a store or they exist on a website and people download them from that. Um, Flatpak makes both of these things possible in a way that is not dependent on any distribution. Uh, so that is a big deal because, uh, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been done before and I think it's something that in general would, um, you know, incentivize the production and distribution of applications on Linux. It doesn't do that for free though. It does that by taking away some of the things that distributions are really good
good at and that right now they're in charge of for their applications, such as you know, uh, making sure that security updates are always there, being in control of the binaries that are distributed, uh, being in control of the version of the library that you know something links to, making sure that there's no deduplication of libraries between different applications that may require it. It's a trade-off. Um, personally, I am you know amazed and kind of mind blown by the fact that Debian can manage such a large collection of packages and always rebase all the applications that they have to work with all these other libraries. Um, but you know, it comes at a huge cost, and I personally think that you know, uh, if 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 those efforts were focused on something like you know ma making these flatbacks, for instance, the whole community would benefit, uh, and not just the people they, they use that because it would work across across different distributions. So you know, it depends really in my mind on how much value you put on the things that I, that I mentioned. Um, You talked a lot about uh, how you create the OS tree and how it gets updated in the field, but you sort of left out the middle bit where how that gets installed on the end user machine in the first place. What are you using for install technology? Oh yeah, uh, good question. I didn't I didn't uh, talk about that. Um, we uh, take the OS tree. We, we make images, so that's um, how you know. If you go to the Endless website, you can download an ISO image and install it. Um, we have two installers effectively, one for Windows and one for Linux. So the one for Linux is super, super simple. We don't actually uh, do any, uh, you know, dual boot or partitioning or anything like that. We just basically take the file system, overwrite your whole drive uh, that you decide to, to use Endless with. Um, and that's mostly because, like, you know, a lot of Endless users won't come from Linux, or if they come from Linux, they probably don't care about keeping both. Um, the uh, Windows installer is actually a lot more interesting uh, because it doesn't touch the partition scheme of your hard drive, like differently from many other Windows installers in the past. Um, it instead installs Endless in a single file in a Windows directory, and then it has a driver in the um, basically in the initrd on the other side to create a device mapper device um, inside the uh, you know inside the system when you boot it that knows where that file is inside the ntfs file system that you have on windows so uh, it basically maps all the extents of the file and recreates the device um, and by doing that you can install or uninstall, and, and then it adds like a, a little EFI loader thing to the window folder for dual boot. Uh, and by doing that, you can basically install or uninstall Endless as if it was an app almost. Like you install it, you can boot into it if you want. If you don't like it, you, you can remove it. Uh, kind of not destructively. Okay, um, regarding trying OS3 in Debian, uh, I'm doing that as part of the Tangle Debian derivative, and one problem I'm struggling with though is uh, basically getting around the concepts of OS3 and get, finding enough documentation on how to build things uh, properly. And what I do at the moment is just look at how Fedora did it and try to figure out how they managed to build the system. And yeah, this is hard, so thank you for your talk, and maybe we can meet later and discuss how how do you, you do it because I think you have a lot more experience with it. Yeah, uh, yeah feel free to find it. be here today and tomorrow for sure. Uh, yeah, the, the project that, uh, that I linked to, it has, you know, the way that we use OS3. Uh, you know, you're right, the documentation can probably be improved, you know. I, I know the maintainer, Colin, is, is always very open to improvements along those lines, but, you know, sometimes I guess things move too fast to, to keep up. <laughs> Other questions? On that subject, um, the OS tree package in Debian, um, I'm happy to merge documentation patches. Please send them. There are bugs I've been tagged help. Cool. Thanks, I was <coughs> cheating and reading some OS tree documentation as you were speaking. So uh, it appears that VAR and Etsy um, management is somewhat separate. 
um, and those are rewrite directories. So for novice users, what do you do to manage that and recovery situations and things like that? Yeah, so VAR is um, it's basically taken as it is and always mounted as it is with your deployment. So um, that's actually useful for us because it's where, thing, where, where the flat packs are installed, for instance. They go into Varlib flat pack uh, and um, you know, other things like drivers that are downloaded at runtime. We haven't really had, you know, it's something you need to be uh, mindful not to send out an update that would not work with some stuff that you have in VAR. Um, but another thing that we do is we have this little package called EOS Boot Helper. Uh, and System D allows you to run certain units after an update, so, uh, but before the actual system boots. So there is a way for us that we, we have had situations in the past where we actually had to do some surgery on a directory or on a file um, before the new update could actually you know, be booted. Um, and we, we have used the system D units uh, for, for that. It has worked, worked out. Yeah. And ETC, so OS3 does something which is, a, so we don't expect people to manually change stuff in ETC, but if they do, OS3 does a three-way merge. So it will take the new version, the one you have, the old one, and try to make the most of it. Um, I think it's an area where, you know, uh, there are other solutions there and, you know, it's an area that may need improvement in OS3 itself, uh, but so far it hasn't, it hasn't given us you know, paired with some ability to do some manual stuff, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't given us many headaches. I would say, on, I think on ETC, a lot of the work that the guys in Project Atomic are doing is about um, sort of basically emptying the ETC directory, isn't it, right? So, um, in fact, in normal situations, that directory ideally would be completely empty and then anything that's contained in there would actually be stuff that the user themselves has changed and then presumably if they changed it, then they know, they know what's going on there. So, you know, um, yeah, ideally, this, you know, there's, there's definitely work to be done there, but it becomes less of a problem over time if we, if we go down this direction. Yeah. Any other questions? I wanted to get clarification on uh, what the person who just spoke mentioned. So the idea, I guess, would be something like, um, since so many applications look into conf files in Etsy uh, for configuration defaults, the idea would be what to maybe migrate a lot of this stuff over into user lib package name, and and you know just have uh, have an approach to config file reading where look for defaults there and look for any overrides in Etsy. Yeah. That, that kind of thing? That's, that's the kind of approach, yeah. Okay. I guess. Uh, and I have user tools writing to other things other than ETC and then having the applications to be able to manage the queries themselves. Yeah, the, there's another, I think, uh, thing that somebody has tried to do, which is to separate the, uh, like for instance, for, for users and groups, right? Like you have ETC, shadow group, pass, pass WD and all of that. Uh, those can actually be generated, like so. You have your definition of the users somewhere else, like you know, in dot d snippets or, or whatever, uh, and then those files are composed when when you boot uh, if something has changed in those configuration pieces. And uh, I think it's called like user generator or something. It's a system D concept, um, and uh, yeah. Otherwise, you do have the problem, like one problem that we had with groups specific, specifically is that if you deploy the same dbootstrap uh, twice, maybe the same group will get a different GID, depending on whether other packages got installed before or after. And that was a big headache for us. We got this bug that we couldn't understand, like, oh, wait, like, oh, the user here, you know, the group changed ID. Um, so we right now have just a static list of all the groups that we expect to be created and we gave them static IDs, but ha using something like a generator would be much, uh, much nicer and more upstream way of doing it, I guess. All right.
if there are no more questions, thanks everybody.